mute all. So good evening, all of you. Welcome to this 175th edition of Thursday Musings, an important topic on school mental health and a speaker who is already working a lot in this field. So we hope to have very uh, first hand, much first hand experience today. Uh, next slide, please. I'm handing over the session to Professor Dr. Tofan Pati, sir. Sir is the chairman of this program. So sir, uh, over to you. Uh, sir, please unmute. Okay, thank you. I was muted. Okay. Please the make next him. slide, please. Please make Tofan sir co-host. Now I have, uh, been I have unmuted. Okay, we have got two vibrant moderators, as I always tell, Dr. Amrit Patadoshi and Dr. Alim Siddiqui, Professor of Psychiatry and Dance of Indian Psychiatric Society. And I need not elaborate in there. We can go to the next slide. Sriya, next slide. Our chairperson, Dr. Pitam Chandak from Nagpur. He did MBBS and MD Psychiatry and MAPA from USA and MEPA from Europe, M Academy UK, M IPS Fellowship. He has Diploma in Child Psych Play Therapy, London, and Clinical Fellow of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in Immense. Working as Director and Chief Consultant of Synapse Mind Care Nagpur and Synapse Child Development and Activity Center. Working as Convener at Child Psychiatry Special Section of Indian Psychiatric Society. Working as Executive Member of Genetic Section of the World Psychiatric Association. Has won many prizes for paper, public representation at various national and international conferences, including the prestigious World Congress of Psychiatry held at Lisbon, World Congress of Mental Health, and Congress of Child Adults and Psychiatry Singapore has 10 publications to his name in various national and international journals. Welcome, Dr. Chandak. Welcome. Next slide, please. Dr. Bheda N. Shatagiri from Bangalore. She did MBBS from JNU, Belgaum. JN Medical College, Belgaum. MD in Psychiatry from JN Medical College, Belgaum. <laughs> Professor at Department of Psychiatry, East Point College of Medical Sciences and Research Center, Bangalore. Visiting consultant at Shishuka Children's Hospital, Lokhonde Hospital, and 23 Kids Clinic. Areas of interest, consultant liaison psychiatry, child psychiatry, women's mental health, and sexual medicine. Has published various articles in national and international journals. Presented oral papers, symposium, and conducted workshops at regional national conferences. Guest speaker and research person for various PGCMEs and conferences. One of the contributing authors for the book, MCQ in Psychiatry, Psychology and Psychiatric Social Work, third edition released in 2022, conducted IPSK C state level MCQ prize examination for UG and interns in psychiatry for the year 2017-18 and 18-19. Position held in organizations, served as EC member of IPS Karnataka chapter for the year 2017-18, 2018-19 and 2019-20. Welcome Dr. Satyagari. Over this further proceedings of the meeting is over to the chairpersons. Shaman will introduce our speaker, Dr. Alan uh, Abhinash Suja, and the other will introduce the topic. Over to the chairpersons. Please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Tofan, sir, for your kind words and for the introduction. Yes, as uh, Alim, sir, has already mentioned, uh, the school mental health is a really important topic. We, as a child psychiatrist, always see it is the first point of contact when we talk about school mental health and no one can be a better person to give us a detailed idea about all these things. Uh, Dr. Avinash Jisuza, sir, he needs no introduction in the field of psychiatry. Sir is working as a consultant psychiatrist and founder trustee Jisuza Foundation, Mumbai. And he is also consultant uh, at Reliance HN Hospital, Mumbai. So I welcome you, sir, uh, to this uh, new edition of Thursday Musings. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, over to you, Veda, ma'am. I think without wasting much time, uh, all of us will uh, get ready to hear from uh, Dr. 
sir more on school mental health trials and trials yes sir. well uh, good evening everyone and it's a pleasure to be here uh, well what i'm going to do is it's not a theoretical lecture i rather felt i will probably share my uh, experiences in school mental health and uh, the the sort of multiplicity of problems that you see the kinds of or unique issues that you face and i think things which we are definitely never taught in md psychiatry but we sort of innovate and enterprise and uh, change things because i don't think many courses in md psychiatry do not have a school mental health clinic which residents visit so it's an entirely new thing um, next slide please Uh, at the outset, there's only one disclaimer that these are my personal views and these are my personal experiences. They may not hold true for every school. You will have to definitely look at the socio-cultural considerations, uh, religious considerations of schools where you work in, and you know decide interventions. I have just uh, aimed to present. Uh, again, I don't have research to you know back my findings. These are things I have done, and on the basis of experience, I'm sort of sharing them. Next slide, please. well uh, my my first uh, priest with school counseling was when i started my practice in 2001 2002 i remember uh, i went to my own school and i told them that uh, now i've become a doctor i'm a psychiatrist some of my old teachers were there the principal was somebody who knew me and i said uh, i will join my own school as a counselor and i remember they told me we can't afford a counselor so if you can come free then we are very happy and if you can do it as a service to your school then we'll be very happy to do it the whole issue was that uh, no one knew uh, about school counseling at that time i had two people who were working in school counseling very much in mumbai we all know them one is dr kc chawda and the other was dr harish shetty so these were two people who were working in school counseling and uh, i just thought that it's good for me to work in schools because uh, at the beginning of your practice you have time you have energy you have everything so why not put it to good use so well i decided and i went to my own school they started referring me a lot of children i used to go for one hour one and a half hour twice a week and they began to refer a lot of children now many a times what happened was they didn't even know who were the children to be referred so very often they would send a note and say that the child is making noises at the back bench you know please refer to the psychiatrist or the child is throwing paper balls in the class please refer to the psychiatrist the child is disturbing the class please refer to the psychiatrist and i remember uh, i used to see these children talk to them and i found that many of them did all that even what we did when we were in school or at least i did when i was in school and i think i don't think i found anything uh, abnormal in them so i would write my diagnosis as normal adolescence and send it back and very often so after a month uh, the principal called me and said out of the 30 40 children that we have referred to you you only been able to diagnose a condition in one child you not diagnosed the rest of the 29 kids you said are normal so i said of course if they are making a noise in the class or they are just chirping away or they are talking away they don't definitely need psychiatric treatment or counseling now a child came to me and said i don't like to study geography so i disturb the geography teacher now he doesn't need a psychiatrist to help him so i said this is more of normal problems that we face and very often the geography teacher may not have been good for all you know so uh, so these were the kind of issues that came up but then of course what is what happened was uh, one of the things i tell all counselors and this is something that i used to do i used to have a lot of time on my hands at that time even now with schools where i work in i take a walk in the school particularly in the recess and the lunch break and particularly i go at around that time that the lunch break merges with my time the recess merges with my time and i take a walk in the school and i particularly talk to children who are sitting alone and eating you know and i always ask them i mean why aren't you playing on the playground why aren't you why are you sitting alone and having your dabba in one corner and uh, they all of them know me because i visit the class so they know okay doctor comes and they said and they call me doctor or sir or whatever and then the children say no i think when i go there all the children bully me or they trouble me so i come to know what bullying is happening or another child will say that i have no friends so i prefer to sit alone or no one talks to me so i sit alone these are the children that we need to pick out you know and these are the children that you know need our help 
and uh, i had a child who was sitting alone and was looking fairly upset and i went to him and he said my mom and dad had a very big fight at home today and mom and dad are thinking of leaving each other and that is worrying me and he is a seven standard boy and sitting all alone in the corner of the playground lost himself and uh, uh, so then i said okay this is the child we need to talk to so i said why don't you come and talk to me i walked with him in the playground spoke to him then i told him we'll call your parents to see me we'll see what is to be done and you don't worry about anything so he ran off to play so these are the kinds of children we pick up when we visit schools we it's not the child who's naughty that needs our help and every naughty child one rule i tell all my counselors is that every naughty child does not have conduct disorder or odd so don't be in a hurry to diagnose conduct disorder behavioral issues do happen but what's happening today is that we have lot many students that have problems i think 2002 if in a class i had three or four children that probably had a problem out of 60 in in uh, and this is i'm talking about psychological problems not necessarily ld or adhd but today today i think ld and adhd is definitely there but i think far more children have psychological problems and there's a need for counseling services one of the good things that has happened is in when i started my work i was the counselor psychiatrist everything myself but now of course we have psychologists who join the school full time so they aid us and they help us in a big way so that one change is what has happened next slide so when we were when i would look at school counseling in 2000 2001 2002 2002 i think in a classroom we had most children who were happy and you know we had a few children who needed our help and i would always tell the teacher that you know if you crack a joke and you find that there's a child that's not laughing you know refer that child to me if you uh, say something funny and you find there's a particular child that is not uh, you know don't refer children to me who don't do homework i said you you need to find that i always remember a very vivid case wherein uh, a child used to not do homework and the teacher kept giving him a remark you know homework not done um, distracted in the class etc all those things were written in the calendar he didn't get it signed by his parents this is i'm talking of the year 2003 i remember very 2004 i remember very vividly and uh, she then sent him to the principal's office and the principal gave a remark that you know your parents have to see me tomorrow and the child came back and none of the remarks were signed so they asked me what should we do and i said why don't you send a pun and a teacher to the house to meet the parent and when they sent they realized that this child was being looked after by the grandparents and he had lost both his parents in a road accident one month back and that made them feel so sorry that this child was probably undergoing that trauma and that grief and they were giving him remarks and punishing him rather than sort of understanding his situation so sometimes or uh, the school has to take that extra mile and even make a home visit if needed particularly if they feel that the child is not you know really cooperating next slide but in today's era i think this is the scenario that i see in you know most classrooms that i visit i see everyone is stressed about everything i see very few children who are happy go lucky i mean i see children there some of them are stressed with the internet some of them are stressed with um, relationships some of them are stressed with academics so we have a whole gamut of people who are stressed next slide and always there's going to be a difference in generations i mean i always use this cartoon in my slides because whenever parents come to me and tell me do you think generation gap is the problem that we face and i always say i said maybe i said we were in an era that the pant was always worn up today's era children i see them i said their jeans are lower and lower and i don't know whether that gap is the generation gap or whether there is anything else but i said there's always this generation gap issue which is there i don't think uh, it comes in if you're aware as a parent you know what happens is parents have to also modernize themselves and i always tell parents that we have to keep in vogue with the times i mean you can't say my parents never allowed me to go out after 7:30 so i won't allow my children to go out today i mean staying out at 10 10:30 is very normal i think in fact 11 o'clock is late or 11:30 is late and our time 10 o'clock we would be in bed today children are bed 1 o'clock i mean times have changed i mean situations have changed we have to realize the generations are different today children have a phone you can phone them in our time when we left the house there was no way our parents would know where we are today i mean children have a phone and you're constantly in touch with your child even if, and he's coming even by auto or by bus you know okay i'm in the bus i'm reaching there's no problem there's traffic i mean he's in constant touch with you so there's nothing to worry i mean birthday parties used to happen once or twice a year 
in our time today i mean i think every week probably somebody's birthday party happens and children attend so there's a changing time and parents have to modernize with the time i mean i always tell parents that in schools today's generation is very very different uh, falling in love is very normal romantic affairs are very normal in our time we were uh, it was never really allowed and this is something which you know we have to realize next slide please how do you successfully manage a school the thing is you need to keep everyone happy always remember in school there are different parties and they all have their needs so the teacher wants to finish her syllabus she gets paid for that she is not concerned at times you know which child has depression or anxiety or panic if he is having panic take him out you sir you manage him but i have to syllabus to complete principal wants that no parent should go and complain school's name should only come in the paper for positive reasons not for negative reasons so she has her thing that no parent should be unhappy teacher shouldn't complain parent shouldn't complain she is more concerned about teacher taking leave who's going to substitute her period all those kind of things worry the principal far more or complains against the teacher and the student of course has his problems that we attend to and for the parents one of their first things is we want to somehow see him finish the exam i get many parents who come to me in a school two weeks before the board exam and they tell me we want to start counseling and i always tell them it's not going to work two weeks before a board exam if he's anxious we need to give him little medication post his board exam we will deal with his issues but no one comes back post the board exam sadly so uh, and very often it also happens that parents always come and say doctor do whatever you want to do somehow see that he gives the terminal exam and i always say ki let him miss the terminal exam it's okay i'll give a letter and they feel no it's such a big thing if he misses the terminal exam i said they will promote him the school will promote him there won't be a problem so there is no issue of uh, you know anything going wrong so why should uh, you know we worry but then no they the insistence is on finishing the exam we need good therapy skills we need to counsel parents sometimes there are times when i've had to tell parents in a school that i think you're wrong and your method of handling your child is wrong though they may not like it but one of the things is coming from a doctor or a psychiatrist it is respected a little than coming from a counselor you know they often very often i remember early in my career they used to tell me you don't have a child how can you tell us about parenting and i would always tell them that i don't have to be i mean there are male gynecs i don't have to have cancer to cure cancer and give them all those kinds of analogies to make them understand that this is a scientific field now of course when i have a son in the 10th standard no one can ask me that i tell them i have been through everything that you've been so i know so there's a difference so those things happen behavior modification in schools are also needed so we have to be adept in what behavior modification kind of things we need to do i will come to that in some time and you have to understand all ages we are going to, we are going to handle all ages it's very important to understand that we handle all ages we handle right from pre primary kg you know and there are unique situations you'll face i remember once a counselor in the senior kg class phoned me and said that the students in senior kg are asking all wrong questions and i said what are the wrong questions they are asking so he said the boys want to know why is a girl's toilet separate why can't we go to the girl's toilet so i said that i said it's okay let's take them for a walk inside the girl's toilet and you know show them the girl's toilet there's nothing wrong and then i told them see you all stand and you all pass urine the girls have to sit and lift their skirt if you want to use a girl's toilet you have to wear a skirt from tomorrow and come and you can use and they said no 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 we don't want to wear all the boys or like you know we are boys so it has to be handled in a fun way not everything has to be taken literally when the nirbhaya rape case was happening i know we had lot of primary children lot of kg children who would say rape rape and you know use the word rape and teachers would say how do i explain to them what is rape they don't know anything about sexuality and i said just tell them when something bad happens to a lady done by a group of bad men and the lady sometimes dies due to that it's rape and that's what has happened to this nirbhay because it was all over they were seeing it on tv they were seeing it everywhere so these kind of things happen so you have to go down to the level of the child at times and you have to update yourself there are a lot of research there are a lot of people who write on school mental health there are a lot of authorities who write about intervention programs they are using so you have to have access to these material and you know you have to update yourself in fact it's very important sometimes to even connect with people abroad who are working in school mental health it gives you a good idea to use those innovative techniques over here next slide <coughs> it's very one of the things which we always do in school mental health is talk about sleep this is something i have always told parents the children have to sleep the parents always come and say bahut zyada so raha hai 
Now, if a child doesn't sleep for eight to ten hours, who's going to sleep? The child is bound to sleep. Teenagers always sleep more. They always sleep late. They get up late. I remember a parent coming and telling me that he sleeps very late. I said most teenagers are that way. They only find their homework by eight p.m. They only finish it post one p.m. And I said they are awake till around two and they get up by seven to go to school. Then they come back in the afternoon and like to sleep. So sleep is very important. But they are uh, and children's schedules today are very packed. So one of the things I advocate in school mental health is please keep your children free from a packed schedule. You know the schedule has to be free. I mean, he I have had children in sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth who tell me, sir, we come to school from seven to one thirty. Then we go home, have lunch, two thirty to three thirty. We have English tuition, three thirty to four thirty, Hindi tuition, four thirty to six thirty, maths and science. Then we come back home, do our homework. We hardly get one hour. There's no outdoor activity. Saturday we go swimming. That's it. And you know they have a busier schedule than we have. And I feel no, you should have some free time to probably do all that you want to do. Next slide. Aggression is something that we need to deal with in school mental health, and that's a very very big issue. So I always, in all my workshops with children, parents, I tell them we're not worried about diagnosis. We treat symptoms. We treat problems. We don't worry whether the aggression is because of ODD or conduct, because we normally first name the disorder, and then later on we shame the disorder. I always say it. So it's better that don't name it. Treat the condition as it is. So if your child is aggressive, and a very simple thing I remember early on in life, I whenever I used to get a child who's aggressive, I would always say, "Mummy, daddy, me se gusse wala kon hai." So they say, "Nee, iske daddy to bahut gusse wale hai, dada ji usse bhi gusse wale." So I tell them, "Ada problem to aapka genetic hai." I tell them, "Abhi ada problem we have to solve." So very often then they realize, "Ha, yes, it's genetic, so it's you know it's that way." It gives them some sort of solace or relief that okay, there's a cause to their issue. Now. Children who are aggressive, we encourage a lot of outdoor sports in the school. We encourage children to put them into, you know, swimming and other things. We even have boxing, taekwondo, karate, all sorts of things organized in in the school. It's it's very important that these kind of things are there. Uh, we also speak to children about, you know, we we've had uh, one of the interventions that we did is we had a white board, a white wall, an entire wall was painted white, and we told children you can write whatever you feel. There's no need to get aggressive. There are only two conditions: you will not name anyone, you will not demean anyone, and you will not use foul language on that board. But you can express whatever you want. The board got filled in a week. We thought it would take a month, and then we had to, you know, repaint it and repaint it and keep repainting it. And people began to write, and it helped to channelize their aggression. I always remember this very unique intervention we did in one of the schools where I worked. I somehow the management was very cooperative, and I said, "Let the teenagers have afternoon school." So post eight, nine, tenth, let them come in the afternoon, and the teenagers loved it. They said we can sleep late, get up late, come to school at one o'clock. We are very fresh at one o'clock to come to school, finish school by six. We can have tuitions, and we can finish our homework by even two in the night. It's absolutely fitting into our schedule. They were very happy. The behavioral issues, aggression reduced. But the tuition teachers were not happy because they had to change their entire schedule because we changed the school. So it didn't last for more than a year. Parents began to complain that you are playing with their body clocks. I said we are actually fixing it. We are not playing with it. So it's absolutely fine. The commonest, the the most thing is that most teenagers come to school at seven, half doped, and then they are sleeping in the class till around eight, eight thirty. It's only by eight thirty nine that they actually pick up, and they come without breakfast. Most of them come without breakfast. What did you have for breakfast? I had half a glass of milk. What did you have for breakfast? I had two padleji biscuits, which I ate in the auto hurriedly. I mean, it's not breakfast. You just had something to just you know munch, and they have breakfast at ten thirty when the small break happens. So the first three hours without food, you know, and teenagers need food, and uh, they are you know attending class. Next slide, please. Well, we also talk to teenagers about. smartphone usage smartphone addiction we talk to them about rational smartphone usage i remember it's a very important question parents always ask me in school mental health that what age should the child be given a phone in 2001 2 3 4 when i started my work i used to say not before they are 18 later on as i progressed i began to say okay when they are in the 10th standard or 9th standard you can give it then i brought it down to 7th or 8th standard and nowadays i say whenever you feel you want to give your child a phone you can give it as long as you feel the child can manage it because we have children in first and second who have a phone 
We have children in third and fourth who have a phone. So I remember I saw a child in third standard with hyperactivity, and I said, "You know how do I?" Call? I said, "I'll give you my phone number. You can WhatsApp me." And I said, "You know, no, I'm not going to WhatsApp you. I need to WhatsApp your mom or your dad, and I can't just WhatsApp you." So, but the thing is, that means a fourth standard child is on WhatsApp. So I mean, so you know that kind of accessibility they they have. So and also the hours of usage and what the parents have to. I tell children. in schools what you see online is not always true <clears throat> we've had frank conversations about dating sites we've had frank conversations about pornography we've had frank conversations about how to sort of uh, limit your phone usage how to use the dnd mode wisely how to remove all notifications so that every notification doesn't distract you i mean we've had all these kinds of thing we've also made them download a, a sleep app or an attention focus app meditation music i mean all these kind of apps we made teenagers download and use so this is help them we've used the smartphone to their advantage rather than to their disadvantage because we can't take away the phone common thing is take away the phone taking away the phone doesn't help the teenager gets more aggressive more rebellious and he'll say now i won't study do what you want you know and you can't put push him hit him or do anything like that so it's very important that we have to go with the flow i remember Oh, uh, in one of my workshops, I spoke to my teenager and said, "Sometimes you have to adjust. You know, why can't you go with the flow?" And he said, "Only dead fish go with the flow, doctor." So I said, "Fine." So this is how teenagers are today. So you know, they are aware. They said, "Why should I go with the flow? If my family wants to eat Chinese food and I don't want to eat it, I don't want to eat it. Why should I stuff myself with noodles when I want to have a paratha?" He said, "I don't want to." It's order it. It can be ordered. I mean, in our time, I know we were told, "Jo khana hai, ye khao nahi to so jao, bina khaye." But in today's era, it doesn't work that way. Next slide, please. So one of the major things which we did in school was bullying. Now, one of the things is you very often take a workshop. You know, you may tell people that oh, I'm going to do an anti-bullying thing, and all these things happen. We had what was called an anti-bullying week in some of our schools, where we said. that you will make posters about anti bullying you will make posters about the side effects of bullying and everybody in the class was given 5 minutes to talk about how bullying is bad and we said if someone has had a bad bullying experience <coughs> they could talk about it and we also told we knew there were few children who were the bully per se and we said you talk about why do you bully you know what makes you what happiness you get when you bully and let everyone know and we told the class that the bullying the guy who gets bullied is fine but it's the children who watch that are to blame so we told the children that if you see somebody getting bullied and you go and stop them and you report it we'll all give you a certificate that you've been an anti bullying gatekeeper so they were very happy with that thing and bullying reduced to a large extent we also told them that if you help anybody who's been bullied you'll get a certificate from the school so these were things which uh, you know we uh, used small things wherein you know i i told a child who probably helped five children from not getting bullied i said that you know i will actually click a selfie with you and post it on my social media that you know you are a star anti bullying gatekeeper and it will you know help you and these are things which motivate children so bullying reduces so we had an anti bullying week every year year after year with the 7 <coughs> 8th and 9th participate in this anti bullying week so there are speeches there are debates there are talks which the children do you know and it's not that and this gives them more insight because they go online and they read about stuff and they make their charts their posters their powerpoints etc next slide suicide prevention is something that you have to do in every school suicide prevention is something that is met with some resistance in some schools a lot of principals feel you know aap suicide ke bare mein baat karenge to bacche ja ke kar denge to fir kya hoga i said if we talk about it at least they won't do it I said there's not a single study in the world that has proven that a suicide prevention intervention has led to more suicides happen after that. I said it is never that way. I said we are going to tell them not to attempt suicide. <coughs> so when we spoke about suicide, we've even had uh, with QPR, which is an agency in Australia, we've had a suicide gatekeeping training program for children. You know, so we've had this kind of a thing, and we've had gatekeeping for you know that if anyone tells you I want to end my life. Don't say वो मजाक कर रहा है. I say four of you lift him and put him in front of the counselor. That you know, madam, he's doing suicide. Suicide. Please talk to him and find out. It was very amazing that when we did this in the next one week, I had at least thirty different children come and tell me that I have a friend 
who talks about suicide. Ten are from the school, and we have five from other schools. So we want you to see because we feel that you know this is a big issue, and can you do that? And we actually did it, and all of them, out of them, I think around ninety percent had psychological issues. Treatment was started, and you know we were able to prevent suicide because I think parents uh, were a lot, lot you know happier um, to sort of you know uh, come because the children said, "Mama, Papa, I need to see a counselor. Please come." And you know they were very happy to sort of go and. Uh, some of them even said, I want my friends here because they're my support system. So we can allow the friends during the counseling session and we sort of help them. Few needed medication, we started on medication. So the suicide gatekeeping program was a big hit in, in many of the schools where we did it. And all these programs are done free. We're not charging the students anything. There was some program I know where we charged the students 50 rupees or 100 rupees <coughs> per student, which was, I think, very affordable to most of them. So there wasn't really a big cry from the parents that we're charging or we're making money and it was paid to the school so it was not paid to us next slide <clears throat> the counselor also has to be very digitally sound one of the things i tell all school mental health professionals do not befriend children below the age of 18 on your facebook instagram personal pages it's very very essential that your personal life is kept a little separate from from this also, we have to remember every child has at least five Instagram accounts. So always remember that three, three minimum. One is a very good account, which his parents see and they feel very nice about. One is an account which only his friends have access to. And one is an account done, which is used for all dubious activities and trolling, etc., which the child may want to use. No one is on Facebook. It's only meant for older people like us. Snapchat is, you know, more of the more... Uh, prevalent things. Reddit is a gamers group kind of a thing which children use. And they're on all these kind of sites. You'd not be surprised to find some people on Tinder. You'd not be surprised to find some people on Grindr, which is an LGBTQ dating site. So all these things will also be there and you won't be surprised to find them. You'll never be able to identify them by their profile names and their DPs. It will never happen. So don't even try and search for their Instagram profiles. It will never be sort of found. Same goes with their emails. They have multiple email accounts used for different purposes. It's very important that we speak to children about falling in love in school. It's very, very important. I remember when I did a workshop on Love, crush, and relationships. A lot of parents said that, you know, many of our girls will get spoiled and our boys will and do it separate for the boys and separate for the girls. I said, why? Girls fall in love with boys and boys fall in love with girls. So why should it be done separately? They rather sit together and know about it together. I remember a parent telling me my child is in a only girls school, which is a convent school, and uh, they will never ever fall in love because the sisters are very strict. And I always told her, God is very kind. There's always a boys' school nearby. And they both leave at the same time. So what doesn't happen in the school will happen in the by lanes. I see it happening in so many schools. Both leave at the same time. And they the lane is where they meet, they speak. So crushes and love affairs will happen. Children ask me in school, sir, is it okay to fall in love? I said, it's a normal emotion. There's nothing wrong with it. It's okay to get angry. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to fall in love. You're with a particular person, six, eight hours in school, another four hours in tuition, 12 hours. You're bound to like something in someone. They are bound to like something in you. It's okay. But you also have to realize the other person may not like you the way you like them. As long as you realize that and you're happy with that. I remember many, around 2011, I had a nine standard boy who came and told me, Sir, I like this girl. Should I go and, you know, propose to her? I said, go, but go with the intention that she may say no. She'll give you the eternal statement. You're just a good friend. Be happy with that. And I said, don't make it awkward and not talk to her after that. So, and I said, in case she says no, then you have to, you know, search elsewhere, move elsewhere. Don't get worried and don't get affected. So he came back to me and said, sir, I proposed to her, but I think she only likes me as a friend. But at least I am off the gas now. I'm not worried. I'm, I'm settled. Now, you know, I look elsewhere, as you said, and I'm happy in life. So I said, yes. So I said, and I said, will you keep talking to her? He said, yes. I said, and I tell children, please have the maturity. Adolescents, I tell them, have the maturity to talk to someone who says no to you in love. It's okay. They may not necessarily say yes to you. It's absolutely fine. Don't feel rejected, dejected. You know, you're not a piece of cloth that is rejected. You're a human being. It's okay. Not everyone may, you will have someone who like you at some point of time. And it's not compulsory to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. So don't have that myth also. 
<coughs> you need to answer all the questions that adolescents and parents have it's very very important they i mean whatever questions they have i always answer i never tell anyone it's not the right age this we will see later no i never talk about that i make sure that i answer everything and a lot of knowledge with regard to sexuality also has to be given to them i'm going to talk a little bit about sex education a little later next slide please yes so as i was talking about failed love affairs it's very important we did a workshop for 9th and 10th students on how to handle rejection in love which was very important and we said that if someone says no to you or someone is in love with you and wants to move on it's okay it's absolutely fine it's normal don't think of it as you know a, a blemish on your cv it's not a blemish it's absolutely fine if this happens it's part of life you have to face these rejections it's very normal so we did an absolute 2 3 hour workshop on this where children spoke they discussed we discussed many things and they were they said how long does it take to you know overcome a breakup i said the breakup is your if you can get it out from here you'll overcome it in one day if you can't get it out it'll take a few months so it takes time but i always say everyone is different different people cope differently they take their own times <clears throat> but they they can overcome the breakup if they need next slide yes we also had a workshop on foul language you know many people come to me and say he's showing the middle finger he's doing this he's doing that all these kind of things happen in school so we had a workshop on bad words you know what the bad words are what they mean so we actually put up a list of bad words and told people to write the meaning what was very shocking was a lot of people used the bad words but they didn't know what it meant and uh, very often then we told them now would you like to you know write your dad's name your mom's name your family's name your name before these words no so why do you want to then use it on others when you don't want to use it for yourself don't use it on others it's something which is important and i won't say that the workshop reduced foul language use but one thing which did happen was it did did reduce it to some extent you know my memory takes me back to a school teacher we had her name was mrs popley and i have i take her name with her permission she came up with this very innovative way for us if we use foul language we had to write the bad word with its meaning 20 times and get it signed by our parents no calendar remark nothing that was the thing and she said no one no one will know about it you have to just come and give it to me i'm not going to tell the class or i'm not going to tell anyone so i remember i have a classmate of mine and this is to explain to you that there was no punishment the child was not insulted degraded nothing happened so he was caught okay and everyone knew he was caught so automatically for the next week no one uttered any bad words so we were in the eighth standard and uh, he's a doctor today that boy he's a classmate of mine and uh, he was made to write that word 20 times i told him how are you going to get it signed from your parents he said theek hai ek raat hai manage kar lunga kar lunga he went his father shouted at him his mother shouted at him they came to the school to apologize to the teacher but they somehow signed it and gave it to him he says even today when i drive a car and a car overtakes me wo gali mere muh se nahi nikalti hai he says the impact of that punishment is so much that that word is something which i have never used after that he says i may use better words bigger words smaller words but i never use that word what i'm trying to tell you here is sometimes punishments have impacts without being physical you do not be physical you don't have to give a remark you don't have to insult you don't have to degrade and it leaves a long lasting impression on the child's mind next slide please we also train children in self esteem what matters most is how you see yourself so we tell a lot of children you have to write 10 good things about yourself and 10 bad things and very often writing the good things is very difficult so then we take that on so this is done for any age group but we do this kind of a workshop also next slide <coughs> so where should the counselor go the counselor has to go everywhere school mental health professional psychiatrist you go to pre primary school good touch bad touch teach them about you know hygiene dental hygiene oral hygiene bathing everything that's your job you do everything secondary school of course we are there we are all over the place teacher workshops parent workshops uh, we have all sorts of things we have orientation programs we even orient parents that now your child is in the 10th it doesn't mean that uh, you know you overreact you get anxious we orient them before the 10th we orient them after the 10th so all these kinds of multiple things are what are what is sort of done next slide well uh, also psychotherapy in various settings now i remember in one of the schools where i work the counselor came up with an important group therapy session called i am in a soup 
the aim of the group therapy was any child who's being caught for bad behavior will be in that group therapy session so all the four five people caught for bad behavior were put into a group and they were spoken to and they didn't feel cornered or punished similarly four five children who were having exam anxiety were put in one group and we spoke to them we had four five children with uh family problems where the mother and father were fighting put in one group and we spoke to them four five children with stage fright were put in one group and we spoke to them and it worked because they felt that solidarity that there are others also like me i'm not the only one alone there's a very important thing about confidentiality in school mental health you have to have a principal who's sound sometimes you do have to inform the principal but the principal shouldn't tell the teachers otherwise it becomes a talk of the staff room it's very important that the principal has to you know be sound and uh, aware not to sort of you know spill the beans about certain things and sometimes we have joint sessions for the parents and students or uh, what is the method of therapy to be used there is no method you can use whatever you want it's better to go eclectic i don't prefer a particular school i always say and there's a plethora of workshops you can do in the school whatever the school wants we do we tell the school you tell us what you want and we'll do it next slide <clears throat> well the future of school counseling there's a lot of things we need to diversify our services there's a huge future in the field so i tell people please take up school psychiatry we need more and more people school psychiatry is important a you get known that's very very important you get to address a large number of your community immediately and every child that comes to you also has a parent that sometimes has a problem so the parent will also start to come to you so your practice would definitely increase and if you get four five children okay you know you'll have 13 or 15 who come to you suddenly you know with these issues so it's a very good medium from a practice point of view i'm not saying you may always earn but it's a very good thing to get known in the field so you must be a part of schools and i think i think one of the basic basic things about schools is the beautiful part about school is you see a child who you start intervention in the 6th and 7th standard and you see him pass out with 90% in the 10th standard and you actually feel that you've done something good that's the best thing about schools i remember we had a child in one of the schools where i worked and he used to do these kind of activities he would jump from the first floor of the school down he would climb up and down the drain pipe to the third floor and obviously people were very bothered about him that you know why is he doing all this and there was no conduct issue it was just a thrill that he would get in this and he was referred to me and i remember jokingly i told him i said you should join the army or navy and i think you know because you're so fond of this many years later i remember i landed for an event uh at uh, chandigarh airport and when i landed i had two army jawans who came and told me sir uh, you have to come there our major wants to meet you and this and this and whatever whatever so i had seen this child in 2002 and i went to chandigarh in 2018 or 2019 and they said you have to come there and i was surprised i mean i thought why and what so they picked up my bag and all i don't normally like that but they said no you have to come and i said okay and that boy told me sir do you recognize me i said no i don't recognize you at all so he said you remember this boy 2002 you saw me in school and i used to climb the drain pipes and this that and all so he says yes i am part of special commando force now of indian army you know and i'm here to train people in all these kind of things and whatever you told me join army so i join army and i somehow thought to myself that i actually told it to him maybe out of a joke out of fun but he took it seriously and today he's you know in such a good position and he told me anything you need in chandigarh i own this area you just tell me i mean there's no problem so i mean sometimes you know you do feel you made a huge difference to people's lives by a small thing that you said and these people remember you more than anything you know next slide <clears throat> and yes we always tell parents that it's not only academics there's a lot to life beyond academics i always tell parents we've all done badly in school who asks us today why we failed in ninth history who asks us today why we did badly in geometry no one but we have to understand that this is all a part of life next slide and there's a future all of you seen the movie we know that yes talent matters it's not always the marks next slide so we today also see an era where children are becoming adults very soon and i call it the new sexualized childhood so we're seeing children in primary dress up like this and i always say that no there are some limits some boundaries that have to be set we cannot really probably you know have them dress up like this so we always talk to parents about boundaries to set when it comes to over maturing your child at an early age this is something in schools which is very very important the kind of dress they wear what they wear how they wear next slide 
this is the look that most principals give me when i talk to them about sex education and they very often tell me that you know if we have a session in our school don't you think sexual activity would increase now this is very important to understand that sex education has to happen does it happen for the boys and girls separately it's an absolute no i can have a lady counselor a lady psychiatrist with me in the session but it will happen for both boys and girls together they have to know about both genders so it has to happen together and it is a must there's no escaping this it is very important that sexuality and gender education happens in schools next slide so we also have to talk to children about multiple things because they have a lot of exposure to sexuality on screen so it's very important now earlier i remember we used to have this powerpoint with the anatomy and the physiology and teach them all that today we don't do that children know about all that we normally have an open q and a on sexuality and children ask us questions like why are contraceptives flavored why are pornography sites having so many varieties of sexuality what is normal what is abnormal means they are already aware of this 12% of the internet is pornography children between 8 and 14 have seen pornography so we have to be aware that you know this is this is something which is very very important that you know you address these issues we talk to children even about contraception because sexual exposure happens early i have seen children at 13 14 15 engage in sexual activity they have to be aware of contraception i have had a school where a ninth standard girl asked me is it okay to take an i pill every week that means they are aware they know and i tell them no you can't do it it's supposed to be an accidental contraceptive it's not meant to they know it's an accidental contraceptive so that's the kind of knowledge they have next slide <coughs> this is again a little bit about you know they maturing earlier i mean it's we have this session particularly for parents of girls and we say that we have to be careful about the way we dress them up i'm not saying dressing them up is bad but not too early at the right age yes let them look more mature when they are 12 13 14 15 years but not too early next slide yes and love affairs we talk about love I mean, I remember in the chat someone has asked, "Is it wise to advise children about boundaries of love?" It is important. They have to know. I always say, "What is acceptable at one age is not acceptable at another." So, if you have your KG children sit stand with this heart, you will click a photograph. But if you had ten standard children stand with this heart, I mean, parents go up in arms that you know what is happening today. Boys and girls holding hands is very normal. Boys and girls putting hands around each other's shoulders is very normal. In one era, it was considered. no no physical touch has to happen hugging is very very normal in schools it happens so we have to understand that times have changed meeting over tea or coffee is no longer love even friends can meet over tea or coffee so those are things which are you know important to understand next slide <coughs> we also talk to children about lgbtq plus they have to be aware we have a lot of children in schools who come to us and tell us I feel I'm gay. I feel I'm lesbian. I feel I'm bisexual at thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and I tell them, okay, fine, it's fine. Don't get worried. But the thing is, we have to wait till your twenty, twenty-one. Let your sexuality develop. We'll see how it develops, and then on that basis, we'll take a call. There's no need for you to come out now, profess to the world, and you know, uh, we've had children who have also said, can we be allies of the LGBTQ plus community? And we've had schools. where i have actually gone with them and they have participated in the pride week march of the lgbtq plus community as a school they have represented their school that we support them we don't necessarily belong to the community but we support them so these are and they've gone in school uniform properly dressed so these are things which we've also done in schools next slide child sexual abuse is something which worries us sometimes in school and you have to be aware of the poxo act and what it entails So every school where you work, make sure that teachers are aware of POXO. They have signed a POXO declaration. Make sure that you have a POXO committee of the school. Make sure that you have a POXO box in the school, so that if children feel something wrong is happening, they address it. Of course, they put all sorts of letters into that box. We screen them. You know, they might put complaints against teachers, do some kind of stupid things, put some bad notes. All those things happen. But there are some very serious, uh, genuine complaints. that also come and then we have to address them when they come the school has to report to the police we have to report we tell parents you don't want to report you don't want to follow up the matter that's your personal prerogative it's our job to report and we will report because the onus is on the principal and the school psychiatrist so we have to report 
and we have a poxo orientation workshop for the teachers we have i remember teacher telling me but when we take kg children for swimming we are changing them don't you think that is poxo i said you are changing them in a group there are so many people there you are not changing the child alone in a room so i mean and i said everyone is around so there's no issue of you know anything going wrong so these are things when they go on a trip teacher say that <clears throat> you know can we knock on the bathroom and call them that you're bathing for too long i said that's not box you're not entering the bathroom and doing anything so it's okay you have a right as a discipline to you know call them out so all these things are you know round things about poxo that teachers come up with we teachers ask what if a false complaint is put and i always say we are here to investigate that also the school is video camera nothing can go wrong so there's nothing to worry all the video cameras have to be working see that it's maintained see that recordings are available for at least a month all those things are very essential next slide so some interventions that we have tried the school has to be colorful very very important the canteen has to be colorful it's not to be dull it's something which is very important next slide children are allowed to paint the walls they can paint the walls of the school in any how they want paint pictures they are allowed to do a little bit of painting work it's very important for their rhythm next we have an open mic in the school a child can go say what he wants he can sing there is and it's recorded and it's played on the intercom so we have this kind of a facility in some schools also next slide we have a music room in some of the schools where there are all sorts of musical instruments and the child can go pick up any instrument he wants and try and play it to get a feel of it and then if he likes a particular instrument he may join music classes for that instrument but he's allowed if he's upset he says i want to go and just play the guitar please go <clears throat> i'm upset i want to go and play the tabla please go it's allowed so we have this kind of a facility also next slide there is also something called a games room in school so if children feel bored sometimes or they have a free period they can go into the games room and play games they don't necessarily have to be sitting in their class and looking at their books and doing their homework even if they are stressed they can go and play some games it's very important sometimes even as a counselor we play some games with them and talk to them and it sometimes helps to build that rapport and break uh, the boundaries that are set at times which is very essential next slide yes so children instead of being punished are sometimes told that a uh, this is of course a phone booth example but we have what is called a mental health booth where we say you have to go sit there for half an hour read a book come back and tell the class what you read that's your punishment we're not throwing you out of the class and making you kneel down no you go there sit for half an hour read a book and when you come back in 5 minutes you have to tell us what you read so this is something which is one of the methods that we use and a lot of pro mental health books are kept there which you know children can just pick up and read they're not allowed to take it home but they can pick up and read next slide we have painting exhibitions for children they are allowed to paint put up their paintings and uh, there is no award everyone gets an award so there's no first prize second prize third prize everyone who paints gets an award next slide yes they are allowed to paint the school wall so they can do paint a wall how they want 10 people can take up one wall and paint it the way they want and of course the walls are photographed they are put in the school magazine they form the cover of the magazine so there's a lot of incentive for painting a school wall so this is also something which we can do next slide some of them come up with innovating 3d kind of paintings like this also on the wall next slide this is a think booth which is of course a japanese concept but we said in schools we can have something like this when a child is upset and he says i want to take some me time off okay you go into the think booth and you think what went wrong whatever there's nothing there there's just a table you can have a paper and a pen and write about what you want take some time out for 15 20 minutes and come back and then we discuss it next slide in one of the schools i did suggest at times that you know if there are children who are too upset you did give them some time to nap have a napping booth where they can go and nap but not many schools have taken up this offer but this is something which i think can be sort of worked out and tried as well next slide children are given access to polaroid we tell them that okay you know you are out of the class for the next 30 minutes you can take this polaroid camera and your punishment is that you have to go and click a photograph of some positive theme of your school so they go click a positive theme photograph and come back and it's put up on the notice board so the punishments are not negative the punishments have to be positive and they have to write around two three sentences positive about what they saw so it just changes their mindset from where they are next slide 
even in government schools ruma ma'am these things can be applied it's not necessarily that these have to be private schools they don't require a lot of money they just need incentive and good donors and it can be applied gardening in schools for children very very important even the schools that i work 50% are government schools and 50% are private schools and we've applied this in government and municipal schools also we say make your own garden i mean you all have a right to you know decorate your school so plant trees in your own school watch them grow label your pot water it every day see the plant grows then it goes to the main garden where the gardener takes care of it so all these things are done these are all interventions that work next slide creative writing workshops can be held and these are done free again we get people who come and do it free they are allowed to teach people to you know creatively write and do these things next slide <clears throat> photography children are allowed to have their photography exhibitions because photography gives you the opportunity to use your sensibility and everything that you are to say something about the photograph is clicked sent to the school the school gets it printed the children don't have to spend anything they just need a phone which all of them have they click a photograph send it to the school email we get it printed we get it framed we get it put up so it's something that you know is just used to you know and we tell them is a mental health photography contest so tell us a theme that you know and the theme changes every year we have it twice a year it's something we get around 30 40 entries we may not get a large number of entries but it's a good thing to have there's a wall put up next slide and this is something i always tell every adolescent that i meet you're confined only by the walls you build yourself you're not confined by anything else it depends on what you want to do how you want to do it and you know how you want to probably move next slide and lastly i tell children that mindfulness meditation yoga is also important because the earth even has music for those who want to listen next slide the difference between school and life in school you are taught a lesson and then given a test in life you are given a test that teaches you a lesson so we have workshops for children where we tell them let's say you are at home and your dad gets a heart attack what are you going to do so then you know they come up with solutions we say let's say your neighborhood auntie neighbor auntie falls in the bathroom and is breaks her leg what are you going to do no let's say you lose your wallet what are you going to do let's say you lose your mobile what are you going to do so life situations and we you know tell them we we give them solutions as to what they're going to do so this is something which is which is very very important next slide does sex education encourage sex no most parents are afraid that talking about sex with teenagers will be taken as a permission for the teen to have sex nothing could be further from the truth if anything the more children learn about sexuality talking with their teachers and friends and reading accurate books the less compelled they will be to probably find out for themselves this is very very important i have never had in 25 years anyone come to me and say post your sex education workshop children have gone and had sex no it's never never come to me ever next slide and this is something i tell all parents letting go of your kids is not just them physically moving away it's also letting go of expectations or aspirations or dreams that you may have for them it's letting go of the control of their choices it's letting go of your heart while trying to hold on to your values and when i let go i hope an even more beautiful life will come to fruition for my kids than what i have imagined let them be the way they have to be it's very very important parents come and tell me mera bachcha baat nahi karta hai aap counseling karke usko khol do i said no there's no way let him be quiet it's okay someone says mera bachcha bahut baat karta hai aap usko change kar do i said there is no need for it to happen that way there's no need for that to happen and this is something which is very very essential next slide yes this is my last slide before which i will give you Uh, this is very very important it's a quote i use which is very essential when i was 5 years old my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life when i went to school they asked me what i wanted to be when i grew up i wrote down happy they told me i didn't understand the assignment and i told them that they didn't understand life so the whole thing is that we have to allow children to be the way they are i will give you two personal examples here which is very important and i think when i was in school and i was in 7th standard i was a rather shy boy we had one of my teachers who told me that i will open you up i don't know what got into her head and she got after me and she said you have to go and participate in the elocution and i said ma'am there's no way i'm not going to go on the stage i'll get upset i'll get very and she made me learn a poem which i learned by heart i had the brain to learn so i learned 
then they put me on the stage i was trembling i was not able to speak and i came back my entire class got up and clapped for me because they knew it was a very big achievement for me to go on stage and then i came home and i told my parents luckily both my parents were psychiatrists that was a very big advantage and they told them i'm not going to school from tomorrow they have made a complete fool of myself so my dad said i will come and talk to the principal and he came and told the principal you dare not interfere with my son if he's an introvert let him be an introvert don't try to change him don't try to do anything and i was very happy that you know my parents stood up for me so that gave me a lot of confidence i remember i told my mother i'm very shy i'm very introvert what will happen she told me one day you will talk everyone will listen don't worry you know you'll overcome all your introvertism as you go and it's true when i joined medical college i was forced to talk because you see patients you see people so you know automatically you overcome it the second thing i remember from my school life was and this is very important for school mental health i had a teacher who wrote me a remark in my calendar because i got 0 out of 20 in a maths test on fractions no one likes fractions it's a very difficult chapter so i got 0 and she told me you will never do anything in life she wrote in the calendar hopeless good for nothing and she signed it it was in my maths book not my calendar and i remember i kept that maths book for many years and i said i will get even with this lady at some point of time nearly this happened of course in probably 88 89 90 that 1990 2007 my school told me that we want you to address the pta the parent teacher association i said i will come provided this teacher who's the maths teacher felicitates me so they said why are you so insistent i said i have a reason for that and i took my notebook with me i had it with me all these years and i sat with her she felicitated me i didn't say anything i never insulted her in front of everyone and after she felicitated me she said it was a wonderful talk this that then i showed her that book i said madam this is what you wrote i said now change this and she actually changed it and she said you have achieved everything in life and she signed and i said remember what you say to a child can have a positive impact i said i came back with the ability to show you not every child would i said so as teachers we have to be very careful because what we say teach teachers are taken by children as god they are valued more than parents at times teacher ne bola hai it's a very big thing so i said we have to be very careful about the words we use the comments we make because it we never know where it impacts a child next slide thank you thank you very much and i think if there are any questions i'll be more than happy to answer them <clears throat> thank you dr vinash a very uh, from the heart presentation very lively very interesting i think all of us were very engaged uh, over to chair persons for their opening remarks yeah definitely as expected it was a wonderful presentation from avinash sir uh, of course when we talk about school mental health many theoretical concepts uh, come to our mind many things we think about it ki aisa karna chahiye tha waisa karna chahiye tha but what sir has uh, mentioned in his overall presentation the very practical approach and whenever you go to school uh, you face with all these technical difficulties all these issues what uh, you are coming up and definitely as many of the participants are aware ki again uh, it's it's not about ki it's high urban school that they will be open for it again we have keep on pushing for some amount of again every is not possible in every school every management is not open for everything but if we implement some amount of the things so that can be really helpful for the school and particularly for the child what we are dealing with so i feel it's it's a really important topic and as we all know majority of the psychiatric illnesses starts uh, before the age of 14 years so it is a age group that we should be really cautious with and we should take all the efforts whatever from our end in uh, whatever capacity we can to help this uh, uh, school uh, as well as the school uh, overall uh, management yeah i do agree with uh, sir dr what uh, dr pritham shared um Uh, sir shared his practical viewpoints on the current topic which is quite uh, important for the parents the teachers as well as the counselors and uh, of course uh, the school principals i would say um i uh, 
what i liked about the presentation was uh, sir gave a lot of practical inputs rather than the, the theoretical uh, inputs which can be applied across by most of the parents and the school teachers and the counselors across uh, our uh, yeah, across the country what i came across uh, uh, when while i read about all these uh, um, uh, school mental health programs although it has been in implementation for the last 40 years but a comprehensible approach is not uh, there across the country and across the states due to various reasons so many of the states have been implementing this uh, school mental health programs in their own way so um, I think there is a lot of mental health gap that actually addresses these mental health issues. And uh, what I feel personally is even when we go and deliver lectures or talks, we emphasize more on psychiatric illnesses in this vulnerable age group rather than talking about the general mental health. What is mental health? And then we have to actually um, educate the uh, crowd maybe uh, which consists of both parents as well as uh, the teachers as well as uh, their care caregivers. So uh, this is one important aspect. And uh, uh, in every school, like Sir said, uh, sexual education must be implemented as a part of curriculum and also as per the competency-based uh, education modules that are going on as of now. I think life skills training, uh, which includes some amount of empathy, then uh, you know, building more on uh, communicate effective communication, creative thinking, like Sir said, as well as critical thinking, these problem solving skills, and all these things can be emphasized as well. So I think overall uh, the, the presentation went on really very well, sir. And uh, I think if this presentation is reached to most of the parents, teachers, and most of the stakeholders, definitely it is going to make an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's for the 175th edition of Museum. Yes, sir. <laughs> We are glad to be a part of this. So we'll take a few questions, not too many questions, because Avinas has been very, very, you know, there has been a very exhaustive presentation. Arim, you please. Yeah, uh, Avinas, there is a question on substance use. <coughs> uh, cannabis, a lot is being used, inhalants, everything. Yeah. So how to handle this, how to educate? Well, I think uh, in all the schools, we do conduct an addiction awareness workshop. Like today morning, I was at a school in Mumbai and we did one workshop. Uh, we spoke about cannabis use. It's See, the treatment aspect is one. We all know how to treat, how to manage. There's no doubt on that. But we create awareness in, about the myths. The myths are that it makes you more creative. Children feel I'll be able to perform better. So that has to be debunked. People feel it's organic, it's herbal, it's plant-based, it's safe. So that has to be debunked. There's a lot of positive things about cannabis online, which are written by non-medical professionals. So people mm. feel that, you know, it is something which works uh, well and it's something that can be used. So that is something which has to be, you know, debunked. So we actually put a website on and tell them, see, this is what you read. And this is something that is, you know, not correct and not proper. We also tell them that cannabis affects your brain and how it can lead to psychosis. It's something that children should know. So, And we do this for vaping, smoking, alcohol. Uh, I mean, because it's something that children experiment with. And the main thing to emphasize is to tell them that even recreational cannabis use is harmful. You know, one of the things that a lot of people feel is if I use it recreationally, it's okay. But it's not something which at least we would sanction. So this is something that I think we work with. Of course, we treat it using whatever medications we want to if we get young children who are abusing cannabis. But more than that, I think awareness on these lines is very important and it's very cheap. So I think that's the reason why many adolescents take to it. I mean, they can use their pocket money to get cannabis. It's not a very expensive drug to get. A vape is far more expensive than cannabis. Avinash, in many schools, uh, if you talk that uh, relationships are okay, uh, you you it is okay to have the principal and the teachers they get panicked so in such no so i no no i remember a principal asking me that do you mean to say that if a boy and girl fall in love in the 10th standard it's okay so i said any relationship that makes an individual thrive is okay according to me i said if it's smothering the child then it's something that shouldn't happen i said i'm not saying that you know love is essential I'm not telling everyone that you must fall in love. 
But I said, if it happens, I said, what do I do? Do I tell him, leave it? If he's finding some peace and solace and it's helping him thrive, should I leave it? I'll give you a very simple example. In a school that I know, uh, around five years ago, the two toppers fell in love with each other. Okay? They were first and second. They would study together. So the parents told them, now you have to focus on your studies. Uh, if you do very well in your exam, then we'll allow you to do whatever you want. So one got 99% and one got 98.8%. So they went to the parents and said, now we've got our marks. We want to go to America for a holiday. Will you allow it? So they said, that no, we won't allow it. So they said, then why did you tell us that we were happy together anyway? You know, that kind of a thing. So children, it's like sometimes the, the relationship may not be sexual. It might purely be an emotional relationship which helps them thrive. And if it does help them thrive, I mean, I see, I always feel in today's era, children are going to fall in love. There's no way you can tell yes. them don't fall in love or there's no way you're going to prevent them from that happening. It will happen. Rather, we support them through it rather than tell them that, you know, love is bad and, you know, all this kind of thing. Like, I remember Amrit took a lecture once on, I think, masturbation. And in sex education, we have a lot of children who, you know, talk to us about it. So I, I tell them, they ask me, why do you so much talk about sex education? And I always say this, that when we were in school, we had priests who used to teach us about sex education. And they told us that if you masturbate, you will anger God and, you know, you'll be, go to hell. And I said, we had to choose between angering God and keeping ourselves happy. We chose the latter. I said, that is what, you know, invariably happened. And I said, it's, it's a very normal phenomenon. Why are we, you know, like we talk to even girls about, uh, we talk to boys about menstruation. We say, why should we not talk? I mean, they should be aware. I mean, there's no reason why they should. Be. So, I mean, I'm not here to say everyone should fall in love. But I'll definitely say that if it does happen, you don't go and slap your child and say, why the hell did you fall in love? You know, you have to probably help them deal with it, manage it, even manage falling out of love. Both are essential. One, one important question, sir. So you are in a tier one city. It's it's okay, but in the tier two and tier three cities, the problem is, you know, people don't accept a psychiatrist. You know, I, parents yeah, don't accept yeah. a psychiatrist. That's that the question that has come, and I have faced it. Why a psychiatrist? They only know how to write medicines, or and if they introduce you, they will tell you that you are a psychologist. Many right. times we we are introduced yeah. as counselors or psycho psychologists. Yes, yes. Psychiatrists. No, no, that that happens, sir. In tier one cities also. Only 30% acceptability is there. I'll put it very clear. I mean, even in tier one cities, even in a school, when I have seen a particular child and called the parents, I've had parents who come into my room and said, why the hell did you call my child? You know, I mean, I've and they said, you will not call my child again. We don't want any help. We don't want anything. And there are times when the child says, mama, I need help. And he says, no, we don't want you to see anyone. And the child says, what do I do? I said, I'll help you in whatever way I can, but I can't do anything for you if your parents don't consent. You know, these kind of things happen at times. So, I mean, it's there, sir, everywhere. It's there everywhere. I totally agree. Uh, there is a two questions, I think, about screen time, limit of screen time. How does it affect how to cater to it? So, I always say that what is the screen timing used for? See, today... Uh, homework, notes, tuitions, YouTube, there are a lot of things used educationally. So we have to allow that screen time. But if we feel that it's being used for gaming, irrational gaming, which is aggressive, bloodshed, violent, uh, or it's being used on pornography, then of course it has to be restricted. But again, there are many children who have to be online because their tuition groups are online, notes are online, school sends all the notes on email, so multiple things and they store all their notes on their iPad. They don't like to read from a printed uh, notes. They prefer to have all their notes online. So they that's one of their ways of getting to keep the iPad also. So, you know, so it is, it is something like that. So these are, you know, ways and means that children do have now. But then there are ways and means. So if children say, I need my iPad for the notes. I mean, I get all the notes printed. I said, keep everything as a hard copy. Tell him everything is available. You don't need the iPad. You know, so don't give me that excuse. You are allowed, you study for two hours, you can use the iPad for half an hour to 40 minutes. You again study for another one and a half hour, particularly in the higher classes. And then you can use, and particularly strictly no iPad after 10.30 in the night. That is something which I think as a rule, it has to be, you know, followed. It's something which is, which is very, very essential. Like I yeah. tell families, make a rule that, 
you know everyone keeps away their gadgets for the next 2 hours first person to pick up the gadget for recreational use like i at times i tell my son that my phone wifi is off my phone will ring if people want to contact me that's a different thing but i'm not going to use my phone for the internet for the next one hour so my wifi is off you also put your wifi off for the ipad you know you use it to study i'm not telling you not to use it but you don't use it for games so these are things which we have to mold and manage a common complaint is if they start on ipad or their device for lectures and after a few minutes they shift to some other things or on one window lecture is playing on a minimized window something else is going on no so, i i agree but that is what used to happen when we had online school in covid so you know children loved online school because you know they could do whatever they wanted online the teacher was teaching and they were chatting they were playing games they were doing all sorts of things they were seeing a movie on netflix simultaneously so you know these kind of things used to happen but i think when your child is on a device like an ipad you monitor i mean you have to be around you have to swoop and you you know there's no greater detective than an inquisitive parent i always say that so uh hello am i audible yes 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. yes 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 yeah so there's no greater detective than an inquisitive parents so if you feel that you know you want to sort of uh, uh find out what's happening with your child you will probably do everything within your reach to you know get that uh, sort of moving or done okay so amrit any more questions in the chat box no i think uh, one one interesting question is what do you do with a child who is obsessed with her male teacher well i think you need to speak to the child you know you need to find out uh, what is the obsession about why is there so much of a uh, i mean interest in the male teacher what is probably the reason you know if there is a particular teacher i mean uh, what is that i mean teacher also done to attract the attention of the child i mean these are things which you will have to probably speak to the child about and i mean we i mean always in schools you know i have seen suddenly the ninth standards are studying history and then when you see the history teacher you realize why they are studying history i mean it's a very common phenomenon that we you know do see a young history teacher makes history very interesting it's always there so these kind of crushes and infatuations happen you need to find out why it's happening another thing is if you find that you have boys who have a uh, a sort of attraction towards older women or teachers and the same goes for girls then it's for for male teachers you need to also find out whether there's a lack of you know they're looking for surrogate father figures or mother figures and there's something which is probably wrong in their lives at that level whether there's been any abuse because the psychodynamics works in that way those are things which you need to find out thank you thank you boss karim tofan sir is not there uh, so okay. we can so so uh, thank you avinash bhai uh, i think we take uh, comments from the chairpersons their experiences their thoughts on the topic and then we wind up the session the chairpersons please sir uh, um, i just want to put it across i had done one study on uh, school children basically studying from 5th standard to 7th standard manifesting with the low back ache what could be the probable reasons other than uh, for these physical manifestations what i surprisingly <clears throat> got to know this was uh, the data that was collected was from the rural schools sir uh, we actually gathered data from about 5 to 6 schools and around 1000 plus children were actually uh, interviewed so surprisingly uh, the uh, the results was around 5 uh, to 6% uh, in the sense uh had actual uh, physical disability because of which you know they manifested with this uh, low back ache but uh, concerns were uh, more on you know because of the bad weight and you know the distance of travel and then multiple somatic uh, complaints in these set of children who actually belong to this rural area so um i just wanted to know out of your experience sir, since uh, you were addressing the children those who belong to urban area and the parenting skills and things like that so what uh, i mean you might have even addressed children from the rural background as well so what all are the common manifestations that you you have come across and how do you deal with these set of uh, parents actually uh, wherein stigma is so much and mental health gap uh, lies so one of the things is i always ask the child when parents are not cooperative 
who do you think will listen to me more your mom or your dad so they invariably say i think my mom will listen to you more so i call the mom alone and i talk to her and i say ki see these are the issues and she'll very often say my husband is not going to agree the grandfather is not going to agree i say see your daughter is going to suffer now it's your choice as a mother what you want i said would you be open to help or would you want her to keep suffering the help is available free in the school we don't have to pay so they won't ask you where the money is going all that we can provide you medication you will have to buy which is not very expensive so if you are ready to support your daughter without anyone else in the family knowing then we'll be eager to help you so she very often agrees within 3 or 6 months they see a change in the child so family members start wondering what has happened so they say you know she is much better now and whatever so then i tell the mother then you get the father to see me so then very often there are times when i call the father and i say do you find your child better than before and i tell them that this is what we have done and this is the change we have seen and then the father very often agrees he says no i actually see a change and i think you're right and i think we should use but i mean my family will never agree so sometimes only the parents in a joint family manage this without other members knowing sometimes uh, if there's an elder brother who's an adult the elder brother can you know help and manage in some cases in some cases there's an uncle who manages but then we don't normally go to the uncle because parents can always hold you to ransom and say why did you you know use the uncle or whatever so generally we involve one parent you know it's it's something which is which is very very important uh, year to you know sort of uh, work with and another thing i always tell my counselors it's a very sad thing but i tell them that there are some children who we are not able to help whatever happens i mean we have to just accept they are not our children we can't do everything for them i mean if their parents are not willing to do anything for them what can we do i mean that's something that you know i also tell counselors that we have to accept some children may not get the help it can happen thank you sir i will yeah, just add one thing i remember few months back i saw a child who brought mm-hmm. his son to me i mean i saw a child the father brought the child with adhd and i told yes. the father how did you think of adhd and how did you come to me and he said sir used to come to our school 15 years mm-hmm. ago and my parents never took help i had adhd you know and i suffered i don't want my son to suffer you know and he actually brought the child for help he said investigate him treat him i mean my parents never supported me and i suffered in college i suffered in my post graduation but i don't want my child to suffer so now i brought him for help at an early stage so so sometimes you know these things also happen yes sir thank you pritham yes uh, so sir as has rightly mentioned one thing which i uh, practically feel that is more important when we are dealing with school mental health again you will get a very good amount of cross referral when uh, you are visiting schools you are taking workshops and all those things many of the students or many of the parents because of the confidentiality issue or as sir has already mentioned they might not be willing to consult you into the school premises and all but when they visit to your clinic uh, having an empathetic listening is an important thing many of the times as sir has already also highlighted ki koi bachcha aapke paas aayega you are sitting with him for 10 15 minutes and he is not ready mujhe koi baat nahi karni hai so again that is an important aspect which we should uh, be able to analyze and we should be able to judge many of the times the children take time to uh, to form uh, to form that empathetic bond with you to disclose some things with you to uh, discuss whatever they are going through so having giving them the personal space giving them the time like many of the times it happens that the child is coming and he is not uh, interested in talking to me or he is not interested in uh, having a conversation so we have a, a play room kind of thing where there are as sir has already mentioned we have different activities so we just tell him ki chalo aap aaye ho to aapko kya kya khelna hai aapko kuch draw karna hai kya aapko kuch karna hai kya so it might take a couple of sessions or three sessions to build that rapport and to go into whatever is going into the life so having patience not forcing your things on the child as well and not forcing your things on the parents as well also forms a key thing and post covid uh, i i don't know sir as i address that thing or not but learning issues has been on a significant rise post covid 
so many of the behavioral issues can be on the backdrop of a learning disability which has been going on which is not recognized or if it is recognized not acknowledged by the teachers or parents and all those things so that has also uh, to be kept in mind while dealing with particularly this uh, class of patients or uh, children <laughs> One one very small request to the organizers. I mean, you all are my friends, so I take this liberty that uh, I have spoken on school mental health today. When you have your 225th episode, you can call me to talk on special schools and mental health because that is also another area I work in. Whenever you all feel, and there's no compulsion. I'm just put it to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, Amrit. Uh, over to you. Next week we'll have a break because of the ANSIPS schedule. Uh, over to you, ANSIP, uh, Amrit. Over to you, ANSIPS. Man. Over to you. So thank you, Avinash. Avinash has been the most enthusiastic man who who tells me that whenever you need, I have lots of topics. And Avinash is somebody who speaks from experience. He is absolutely a practical man. He is not somebody who will quote books. I think books quote Avinash nowadays. So somebody has written. <laughs> How many books has Avinash written? I tell, he has written a lot of books, a lot of things. He's a very, very humble man. He has... Boss, how many articles have you written? 930 oh, publications. How many? 930. Oh my God. I'll take it for two days. I'll take it for two days. So he has 930 publications. Ali Mahasmad. You don't have your publication. So that's what Avinash is. So thank you. To our two chairpersons who have been wonderful, Dr. Veda and Dr. Pritam, for agreeing. Thank for you, sir. For Thank giving. you, Amrit, sir, for this wonderful opportunity. We had, we had a very good audience, I think. More than 250, 260 logins, peak of more than 190. And that's that's wonderful. Thank you, Torrent. Thank you, Odisha Secretary Association. Thank you to Thank all you. our colleagues. See you again after 14 days. We're taking a seven-day break. And it's tough for us to come every week. And, and hope to see you with the smiling faces post ANSIPS as well, sir. Alim, sir, as well as uh, Amrit, sir. Come on, even if we lose, we, even if we lose, we'll be smiling. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that. that will win. But then let's see. So thank you, everybody. Good night. Hope to see you all personally in ANSIPS. Catch up with all of you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you. you.